I've been praying all weekend, and my prayer uh, for our church, and for those who aren't yet a part of our church, uh, my prayer has just been for those of us who would gather. And I pray, God, would you save the lost today? God, would you convict the, the heart of the person who's struggling in sin? Lord, would you do what only you can do, and would you do something really special in our church today and this morning? Uh, before we even started, before our first service started, there was a, a young man who came and caught me uh, right over here in the aisle, and he was like, hey, uh, I need to be saved. And uh, just got to visit with uh, a ninth grader about what it means to follow Jesus. And uh, as before we even got started, and I'll, I'll tell you, God has already done something special here today. And if you're here, I don't believe it's by accident. I believe that God has something for you. He wants to do a work in your heart. He wants to uh, restore what's broken. He wants to put you back on the path toward healing and health and ultimately that of following after Jesus Christ. And so let me just encourage you, uh, be open to what God has for you today. You're going to get to hear a wonderful testimony in just a few minutes. And uh, man, God's already been doing some wonderful things. Now, we're in a series. If you weren't with us last week, the series is called This Is Us. And we're essentially like pulling back the curtain and letting you know this is who we are as a church. This is kind of what we're about and makes us tick. Last week, we said to you, uh, we are unapologetically biblical. I really like my ideas and opinions. I might even argue uh, with you about some of those things. Uh, but my opinions pale in comparison to the inspired and inerrant and infallible authoritative word of God. The reason we're unapologetically biblical is because the word has been given to us by a perfect God. And as a result, we can trust in his perfect word. And so we're going to live by it. And we're not going to apologize for that. What the word says, we're going to give to you. Uh, we're going to teach verse by verse through books of the Bible most of the time because we believe uh, 2 Timothy 3.16, the word of God. It is, it is breathed out by God and it is profitable for teaching, for rebuking. Sometimes we need that reproof, training in, right? We need that in our lives so that we will be equipped for every good work. So we are unapologetically biblical. The second thing that I want to share with you today, the second of our values that we wanted to highlight in this series, is that this is a place where it's okay to not be okay. And, and I want to kind of talk to you about why that is so, um, why we are so emphatic, and we want you to know that this is a place, to not, where, this is a place where it's okay to not be okay. Um, just to give you kind of a, a rundown, if you're new here, uh, you don't know our membership. The church isn't this building, it's a people, right? But if you were to look at the lives, just kind of take a survey of our members, here's, here's what you would ultimately find. The members of Cross Community Church are a bunch of self-absorbed, self-centered, self-righteous sinners. We are manipulators and liars. We are unfaithful and ungrateful. We are petty, we are angry, and we are arrogant. We are spiteful and prideful and vengeful and resentful. We are unforgiving, ungracious, unkind, and uncaring. We are gossips and brawlers and addicts and adulterers and enablers and abusers who have all found new life in Christ Jesus. Um, there is no one here that is a part of this church that says, I deserve to be here. I deserve all the blessings that God has given me. I deserve for God to love me. I deserve for God to save me. None of us deserve it. We have sinned in a thousand different ways. And yet, those of us who are here, who are men and women of faith, who trusted Jesus Christ to save us, we're people who have sinned in so many ways who could never have earned it, and yet what we found is that Jesus Christ left the 99 and chased after us. He alone has transformed our story. We found righteousness, not in our good deeds, not in our really hard work, not in our uh, religious practices, we have found righteousness in the person and work of Jesus Christ. That is the gospel. You see, here at Cross Community, we say it's okay 
to not be okay. It's just not okay to stay that way. You see, Jesus has called us out of our sinful patterns, out of our old lives, and he's called us to new life following after his son, Jesus Christ. He is the reason that we're being transformed. He is our hope both for today and for eternity. It is Jesus who we are going to worship here, and Jesus is a God who changes things. Jesus is the one who gave his own life here on this earth to call us out of darkness because we were formerly objects of wrath and saved us by his blood. He was our substitutionary atonement so that we didn't have to die the death that we deserved, but instead that we get to enjoy the new life that Jesus purchased for us on the cross. And so we are a people who are grateful for what Jesus Christ has done for us. If you've been here very long, you've heard my story about what God has done in my life. Uh, The ugly details you might not want to know, I will share them from the stage because this is a place where it's okay to not be okay. I don't know what your sin looks like. I don't know where you've been or what you've done. I don't know what's going on in your story today, but I want you to know that Jesus Christ is a God who leaves the 99 and is chasing after you that you might find new life in him. And so today, I'm going to welcome to the stage my friend Eric Smith, and he's going to tell the story about what Jesus Christ has done in his life. Would you put your hands together and welcome Eric Smith to the stage? Bless you, brother. Good morning, y'all. My name is Eric Smith. Um, It's my wife, Heather, and I have three children, Abby, Stevie, and Kimber. We have a ranch out off of Latham, um, small family farm, and I am currently living a dream that we all always had, my wife and I, since we got married. Been married 17 years, going on. Um, y'all, I'm a, I'm a change man in front of you today, and, and if I get choked up, just realize the closer I usually move to Christ, um, the more heartbroken I am. So I'm going to dig a little deep this morning and share with you guys a little bit about who I am and how God saved me. Um, I grew up in Wickenburg, Arizona. It's on the other side of the country, a town of about 5,000 people. It'd be a lot like a lot of the smaller towns around here. It's a western town. Um, horses and livestock were a big part of our lives, and when, uh, when we had nothing to do, we usually got in trouble. I'm one of six children. Um, I have an older brother, uh, Kevin, an older sister, Ashley, and myself. We have one father. My younger sister, Emily, um, comes from a different dad. My younger sister, Paige, comes from a different dad. My younger sister, Alexandria, comes from a different dad. And I have a new stepdad. Um, My mom and my stepdad, they live out on our property with us. My childhood was chaotic. Uh, because of the never-ending door of new father figures coming into my life, I did not trust men. It's hard for me to picture a loving father um, up in heaven when right here on earth it was something that was not tangible to me. My mom was a deeply religious person. Religion does not save us. The fact that we're sitting in church on Sundays. I was raised Southern Baptist, and we were in church Sunday morning, Sunday evening, Wednesday night, sometimes Thursday night. This uh, gave me a knowledge of who Christ was, but that never penetrated my heart. And with that um, came a lifestyle that um, was contrary to everything a Christian should be doing, saying, or wanting in their life. So I got tied up in into drugs. I was choosing to rebel against my parents and authority. And, um, and so by the time I was 15 years old, I had a good job. Uh, I was working out at a dude ranch and making money. And I moved out of my, my parents' house. And I was on my own. And I was living up at my buddy's house. And we went to school one day after partying all night. And I got sent up to the principal's office. They called me in and they said, Eric, you smell like pot you're suspended. And so I left there and I was walking back through town five miles to my buddy's house, didn't have a ride, and a close friend of my family who happened to be visiting, my mom, her name's Mama Karen, she drives up alongside me 
And she says, what are you doing, Eric? And I said, well, I just got suspended from school. And she said, I want you to get in the car with us. I'm going to take you to Louisiana with me, and you're going to have a good start. And so I made my way out to Louisiana, y'all, and I had left a life that was just leading to my death, basically. I get to Louisiana, and I plug into the youth group there. I get a job. I had a little studio out on their property, and I did really good, y'all. And where I left Wickenburg in a bad situation, I get out to Louisiana, and I get back into school, and it's an accelerated learning program, and I get to graduate a year and a half early. And God opened some doors for me there to live a new life, and y'all, I didn't choose to walk through those doors. I thought it would be a good idea to fly back to Arizona, uh, surprise everyone out there. Some of my buddies knew, and so we had a huge party. And by the end of that night, I was uh, reintroduced back to all my new old ways. I had large amounts of drugs sitting in front of me, and I took off, y'all. I was... um, serving the God of methamphetamines. And that's the only way to put it, because we can't serve two gods. I started using that night. I never even called my mom, my dad, never went and saw my brothers or sisters in town when I landed. I straight started running hard and fast right after drugs again. A couple of weeks later, I was with um, some older people that I knew. Um, they were into bikes and whatnot, and I started manufacturing meth for these folks. I was 16 turning 17, y'all, and my life was beginning to spiral out of control. If you all are sitting out here and you were a part of that or you've, you've known someone in that lifestyle, you know how tough it is. Maybe it's a loved one, a daughter, a son. And I put my family and friends and I burnt all of those bridges They were showing me tough love, which eventually saved my life. When you know those doors are closed to you and you don't have a way out from the situation you put yourself in. I'm going to tell you a little story right now. So from that moment on, the next year of my life was insane. I, um, I started, I was manufacturing dope and running dope constantly, and I ended up in some bad situations. I shared my testimony with First Service, and I'm going to throw in a couple different things here just to give you guys an idea of what that lifestyle was like. So on one night, we had, I made some drugs, and we were taking it down into the valley. And we're in this Mustang GT pulling into this car apartment complex. Now, the people that I was with, we were a rough crowd, y'all. And we got T-boned right on my side door. And my life, it flashed before me that night. I mean, my buddy just turned right in front of this minivan. She plows into us, and thankfully we're all, we all jump out of the car, pop the hood. I mean, this lady is like a soccer mom, and here we are jumping out of the car, grabbing guns and bags of drugs out of the back of the trunk and running. This lady's screaming. Two nights later, I'm delivering those drugs. Situation goes bad. We're standing in this house, and there's four guys, and there's a couple of us, and a dude off his wall grabs this sword, and he swings it straight at my head. And it sure is, no- it clocked me. But the blade was sideways. Bam, hits me in the side of my head, knocks me out. Second time in less than a couple days where my life was almost taken. Third time, I'm, a few days later, I'm doing some more, you know, cooking some more drugs, and that happened to blow up in my face. And y'all, I walked away from that situation and I didn't have any burns on my whole body, which is amazing. Shortly after that, I realized that I had this big hole in my heart and this lifestyle I was living was not filling that in any way. And y'all, I was done. I didn't have any friends at this point, real friends. I didn't have any family members that were gonna be there to support my addiction. I had nothing. So one night after hanging out and stuff, I get on this bike, and y'all have this thing pegged out. I'm in the middle of the desert flying down this road, and I wanted to end my life. Hell, I'm only 17. I have a daughter who's turning 16, who didn't know about this stuff before today in my life. Not that I wanted to not never share it with them, it's just I uh, feel that knowledge is weighted 
And at some point, my kids would be old enough to carry the weight of some of the knowledge and bad decisions that their father had made growing up. Y'all, I've been married 17 years faithfully. I have three kids that aren't even, don't even have the capacity of moving out when they're 15 years old. They have an example between their mother and their father um, of, of people that I believe represent who God is in our household, in our marriage, and try and be a good example to them. I know without a shadow of a fact that my kids have a different example in their life than I ever did. That addiction and that night changed my life, y'all. I rode that motorcycle down that rough road as fast as I could. I had that bike pegged out. I don't know, it could have been going over 100 miles an hour and I lifted up my hands just knowing that front tire would hit a pothole and off I'd go, road rash, and I'd be done. And that bike, this was the road going out to the Chrysler Proving Grounds in Arizona. When you enter their gates, just this big hill and it's just this huge long straightaway it's the middle of the night, and I lift up my arms, and I just was like, I'm done, take me. And that bike just cruised all the way to a stop, y'all. Just stood there with me on it. And I was so mad, I got off, can't even kill myself right, kicked the bike over, and I start walking back. The devil wasn't done with me, all. See, temptation's always there. Even if God's starting to get in our heads and in our lives, there's the temptation. I'm walking through the desert and there's a bucket. And it's got everything in that bucket that I would need to make drugs. Right there. Just right in the desert. I walk past that bucket and I get to my first friend's house. And outside his house, sitting right there, is a big pelican box full of stuff that I would need. I could just take and make more drugs. And I walked away from it and I kept walking. And I got back to my town I came from. And um, that night, a police officer ends up picking me up, a friend of mine. Um, he was a youth group leader for me when I was just a little boy. And he takes me four hours away to a psych ward, a hospital in Mesa, Arizona. It's called Desert Vista Psych Ward for evaluation and to hold me for three days while maybe him and some other people in my town would be able to give me an option when I got out of here. It was on the third day in that hospital, y'all. I'm sitting there on the bed. I am crazy, like in my mind. I would, it was just nuts. And my mom and my stepdad drove down, and they gave me a Bible, uh, this little green NIV Bible. And I, y'all, it was just one of those weird things. I opened that Bible, <laughs> and it just, the first thing I read was, it's by the washing and renewing of your mind according to the Word of God. And that's all I got to read. And right at that moment where I was dead, I had no place to go. I had nobody. I didn't have a brain that worked. My life changed in an instant. My brain changed in an instant. I was, God saved me. Jesus saved me. And, and I've said that you know, you hear that, that Jesus saves. And y'all, what that means is I was that 99. He broke down those walls. He came, he found me, and he got me. I walked out of that room, and I looked to my left, y'all, and one of the old dope cooks that I used to cook dope with is standing right in that hallway, and he looks over at me, and he says, Turbo, what are you doing in here? Y'all, this is like five hours away from where I was hanging out at, right? And I looked and I said, John boy, I said, you go back and you tell everyone they'll never see my face again. See, God took my addiction from me. Not everyone's lucky like that, I know that. <clears throat> never had a desire to go back to that lifestyle. I went into a program called Teen Challenge. When I got out of there, it's a 13-month-long program. It was for men. And uh, through that program, I was given tools, y'all, tools to handle my life and line that up with the Word of God. And everything the Word of God was telling me would break me down. See, I found a place, a home, a true home, and a true family at the foot of the cross. And y'all, I need to hug that because the road's not just done when you're done, right? Right? 
the, the devil, he still seeks to destroy me in different ways than he used before, but he's there. Through that program, though, I, I was given the ability to understand and know the Word of God, and when I left that program, God's used me in amazing ways. He's using my family in amazing ways. Let me tell you what Jesus has done in my life. He's restored my broken relationships. He's restored my mind. He's given me a future and a hope. Y'all, I'm a journeyman electrician, journeyman HVAC. I've helped build two very successful service companies after God um, has restored my mind. He gave me a wife that I don't deserve. He's given me children that don't belong to be mine. Y'all, I, I go through this life at this point knowing that I was dead to this world and at this point God's given me a new life to be a steward over the things that he puts in my life. I did not want to be up here this morning. <laughs> I do not like standing in front and talking to strangers, more or less sharing my life, the ins and the outs, the bad things of my life with y'all. I share this with you this morning to hopefully give someone in this room hope. I'm letting you know that we serve a God that's big enough to come and get you. Who, when he came to this world and revealed to us who he was in human form, he chose to go. And fishermen, I'm a fisherman, y'all, are rowdy bunches, tax collectors. These are people that Christ went to dine with, and that word speaks to me. I was one of them. I was the one that you wouldn't want to be around. Um, you wouldn't want your children to be around. And if God is big enough to save me and give me a hope and give me a future in him, I really believe he can do that for anyone. Oh, praise God for that testimony. Thank you, Eric, for being willing to share with us your story. And it's something that we get to celebrate. It's something where we get to see who God is and what he does. And I would want you to know, like just right up front, um, there is no sinner so great that God can't save. There's no hole too deep that God can't come and rescue you out of. Our God is a God who rescues sinners. And, and listen, He's a God who can rescue you, who loves you and cares for you, who saw you, uh, all of your sin, the good, the bad, and the ugly, the things that we shouldn't talk about in church, right? Like God saw it all. And Jesus, knowing that, he went to the cross and he suffered and he bled and he died for you and he did it so that you could no longer remain in your sin and separated from him, but that you might find a new life and a relationship with Jesus Christ, that is the gospel. That is the thing that unites us. This is a place where it's okay to not be okay, where we can be honest about our struggles. We can be honest about our past. It's just not okay to stay that way. This is a church where we are going to push you and we are going to encourage you to give more and more and more of your life to Jesus Christ until you've given him all because that is the most rich, abundant, lasting, joyful life you will ever lead. In the, the passage that was read earlier in Matthew chapter nine, it's a story about Matthew, the tax collector. Jesus had just performed this extraordinary miracle where some friends had brought a man who had been lame uh, for many years to Jesus. He forgives his sin. He tells him to pick up his mat and walk, and he did. And great crowds are surrounding Jesus, but Jesus wasn't done on that day. Jesus had somebody in mind, and so it says that he left that region, and he's headed to Capernaum, and he comes to a man named Matthew who's sitting in a tax collector's booth. And the man, Matthew, was, he was notorious. He was a notorious sinner. Um, it was a special classification of sinner that you had if you were a tax collector. If, if people would have passed him on the street, they would have moved to the other side. They would have grumbled curses under their breath about him. He was a guy who had burned every bridge. You see, he was collecting taxes for Rome. Um, and above and beyond what people owed, he would line his own pockets. And he didn't just steal from people who had extra to give. He was stealing from people who were struggling to feed their families. Every night they sat and they would have watched as their kids didn't have enough and it would have been Matthew's fault. 
He was enriching himself off the backs of other people, exploiting them. So here Matthew is sitting in his tax collector's booth and Jesus shows up. He left those great crowds and all the celebration of a man who had been healed and he goes and he stands in front of Matthew and he invites him to follow him. He invites him out of that old life of notorious sin and desires to give him new life. The invitation that Jesus made for Matthew on that day was not to go for a walk. It wasn't to walk an aisle or pray a prayer. It was an invitation to become a disciple of Jesus. It was an invitation to follow him, to leave the old life behind and instead to learn from Jesus, to make him his Lord, to call on him ultimately as his Savior. And Matthew, against all odds, maybe recognizing the hopelessness of sin, maybe recognizing that even having all the money he could ever spend wasn't enough, and gets up from his booth there, and he begins to follow Jesus. And Jesus doesn't stop with, hey, bro, you know, you, know, you pray a prayer, you're done. Um, it's an invitation to follow him for his whole life. He ends up at Matthew's house, and um, it's interesting, isn't it, how sinners wanted to hang out with Jesus? They felt so welcome in his presence. Matter of fact, there in Matthew's house, Jesus is seen. He's reclining uh, and sharing a meal with tax collectors and sinners, which to share a meal together was one of the most intimate symbols of relationship and acceptance in the Jewish culture. So here Jesus is, he's sharing a meal with Matthew and all of his rowdy friends. And the beauty of that story is that God saves the most notorious sinner. Uh, Matthew goes on as one of the apostles of Jesus. He would have been sent out when they went out two by two and he would have cast out demons and he would have healed the sick and God did remarkable things through Matthew. Most of the early church fathers would say that it was Matthew who penned this gospel that we're reading today, Matthew chapter 9, which has informed the church for the last 2,000 years. It's remarkable what God can do when sinners turn from their sin and begin to follow Jesus. And what I believe is that God desires to do a new work in you. God desires to do a transforming work in you, to give you new life and hope in him. But in the midst of this story, there's a tragedy too. Because in the midst of this story about the miraculous saving of Matthew and the turnaround that was his life, um, there's also the story of some really religious men. I mean, these are the guys that, uh, listen, they had Sunday school pins, right? They'd won the scripture memory in Awana. They were men who externally had all their stuff together. They would have been at church on Sunday they would have been the people who, who you would have looked to for their biblical knowledge. And I come to Jesus with a question that's so revealing in Matthew chapter 9 in verse, let's see, it's verse 12. I'm sorry, verse 11. And they ask the, the disciples, why does your teacher eat with tax collectors and sinners? Why would Jesus hang out with people like Matthew? In verse 12, when he heard it, he said, those who are well have no need of a physician, but it's those who are sick. Go and learn what this means. I desire mercy and not sacrifice. He's quoting to them Hosea 6.6. 6. By the way, they would have been considered experts in the law. They would have known the prophets. They could have quoted this verse. And what Jesus was telling them is that while they were really good at the sacrifices, the external things were all present in their life. The trouble is that their hearts had never been transformed such as they truly showed mercy to the people in their lives. They weren't reflecting the nature and the character of God through their lives. Go and learn what this means. I desire mercy and not sacrifice. I came, to call, I came not to call the righteous but sinners. This statement's a little bit ironic because everybody in the story was a sinner. But only some trusted Jesus to save them. While Matthew definitely trusted Jesus, he was a sinner. He left his life behind to follow Jesus. The Pharisees instead trusted in their own righteousness. And y'all, that's a little bit of my story. And I was a person who for years sat in this church and I could not see the goodness of God 
through the lens of my own self-righteousness. It wasn't until I came to understand the depth of my sin, of my wickedness, that I could truly see the goodness of Jesus Christ, my Savior. And so today, I don't know where you are in your life. Man, I don't know what your story is or, you know, how deep your sin is, how far that you've gone, but I do know that you're a sinner and that we all need a Savior. And so the invitation for you today is to trust Jesus with your life. In just a minute, the band's gonna come up and we're gonna sing a song. And I just wanna encourage you right where you are to pour out your heart to Jesus, to confess your sin and your utter need for him, to ask Jesus to rescue you from your sin and to give you new life, to leave your old life behind and turn and begin to follow Jesus. That's called repentance. If you're here today and you're a believer, maybe God's begun stirring your heart and you realize that you've fallen into some of those same old patterns, that same old ugly sin. Maybe sin has its hooks in you again and you can't escape it. Well, the, the beauty of it is, is that Jesus knew all of your sin when he went to the cross and he died for all of it. He knew your struggles of today. He knew your failures of tomorrow and he died for you anyway. But the hope that we have in Jesus is that he rescues us from that sin too. And so if you're a believer today and you're caught up in sin, I wanna challenge you to do what the first group did, the unbelievers, it's to repent of your sin and cry out to Jesus to rescue you. For those of us who are believers, James 5, 16 tells us that we should confess our sin one to another and pray for each other that we may be healed. And so maybe during this time of response, you just turn to your neighbor and be like, hey, can I tell you? Man, my addiction's back. Maybe when you meet with your community group tonight, you confess, I've fallen back into pornography again. My heart has become so proud. I'm caught up in the thing again. And there, that person sitting in the chair today or in your group tonight, they just lay hands on you and they pray for you that you might find healing in Jesus Christ. Our God is a God who saves sinners. He's a God who transforms us by his power. It's not our goodness, it's his. And so today, I wanna to invite you just to respond in faith to Jesus Christ, calling out to him for the first time to save you or maybe calling on him to rescue you again from your sin, leaving your old life behind to follow Jesus with your whole life. Would you bow with me? God, we just thank you for the gospel of Jesus Christ. We thank you that you're a God who left the 99 to chase after us. You're a God who saves, you're a God who heals, you're a God who restores. We're thankful for Eric and for his story. Lord, it's a victorious story and we praise you. I believe many more like it are just waiting to be told in this room. So Lord, may you have your way in our hearts today. We pray this in the name of Jesus, amen. Right now, I'm gonna invite you to stand.